It's great to be with you this morning. Uh, I've been looking forward to, to this for a long time. Uh, as Tyler said, my name is uh, Keith Evans, and I live in Pullman, Washington, uh, but I pastored for about 30 years in Oregon, uh, one for a few, about, about six years or so in a little town, college town called Monmouth, and then for about 23 years in the Portland area. And then uh, about four years ago, my wife Beverly and I, we have three kids, they're all grown now and all live in, live in Oregon, but my wife and I moved to Pullman and we now uh, work with pastors and wives and our, our, really our, the heart of our ministry is to help pastors and their wives to, to stay healthy on the inside uh, for the long haul. Uh, you might have, uh, if you've gotten to know Tyler or other pastors, a lot of time what pastors will do is they will spend a lot of energy working and trying to help the souls of others and it's easy to kind of forget your own and and uh, so we want to help pastors stay healthy because we all minister out of who we are and so I've been looking forward to being with you also um, the two churches that I pastored in those 30 years I was the second pastor of the church so they were both church plants setting up chairs doing what you're doing is very familiar in fact the last church I pastored we did this for 12 years I'm not wishing 12 years on you but I'm saying uh, I, I'm familiar and these are good days these are good days in the life of a church where you are learning to trust each other and work together and reach your community and what I want to do today is I would just like to talk with you uh, about what it looks like what it what does it mean when we talk about living by faith what does it mean to walk and to live by faith. And we're going to be in an Old Testament book, in the book of Joshua. It's about, about uh, five books in or so uh, in, the, in the Old Testament. And we're going to be there in chapter 3 in a little bit. But I just want us to think for a little bit at the beginning. Is what does it mean to, to walk by faith? What is faith? What does it mean to live by faith? Um, sometimes we will say, well, you just got to have faith. Come on, come on just have faith. And sometimes that, that comes maybe after a really hard question. In other words, don't ask the hard question, just have faith. And, and I want to say to us, faith is not something that should take the place of hard questions. We should have the freedom as followers of Christ to ask hard questions. Sometimes we get an idea that, that living by faith means that we never doubt. That we're always, if we, if we have faith, then we're always completely sure of what's coming next and we never have doubts, and I'll tell you, if that's what living by faith is, I'm in big trouble, because I have doubts sometimes. Uh, sometimes we get the idea that living by faith is, I have miracles, man, every, just they're just surrounded by miracles all the time. And certainly the Lord's able to do that, but what does it mean, really, to live by faith? I, uh, I, I remember reading about a, a one picture of faith, I guess, I read a story about two nuns who were driving home from, they'd been doing some ministry and they were just on this kind of, the, maybe, maybe, they're, maybe they were in Wyoming. They were, on, they were in a, on a two lane road and they were kind of in the middle of nowhere. And they ran out of gas. And one of the ladies, she said, you know, I remember there was a gas station about a mile back and, and uh, we could go get some gas. And so they looked around their car and they didn't have a gas can or anything. They'd been doing like, uh, medical ministry, the only ki kind of container they could find in their car was a bedpan. So they carried the bedpan back to the gas station, filled it up with gasoline, walked back, and they're pouring, they're standing next to the car, and they're pouring the gasoline into the gas tank of the car. Well, about the time they do that, a truck drives by. And this, the truck driver sees two nuns pouring the contents of a bedpan into the gas tank of their car. And that truck driver goes, now that's faith, right there. <laughs> Is that faith? I mean, what does it mean to live by faith? Well, uh, the Bible gives us a couple of definitions of faith. In the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews in, in chapter 11, verse 1 says this, now faith is being sure of what we hope for, certain of what we do not see. In other words, Faith in Christ is not just wishful thinking, right? It, 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 mean, it means even, even though we don't see God with our eyes, we're growing in the certainty of who He is and what He does. A few verses later, very important verse, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now that right there should cause us to pause, right? 
Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Faith then is, it must involve believing that God is real, that He actually exists, and that we seek Him. It's not just a belief in a, in a bunch of ideas. It's a, it's a belief and a trust in a person, the person of Jesus. In fact, I'd like to give us a definition of faith if you're taking notes. This is just mine. I, I, I'm sure there's better definitions. But the, this is a definition that I want to give of what it means uh, to have faith in Jesus. I would describe it this way. Faith is my growing confidence in God. Faith is my growing confidence in God. That's what it is. It's not just a, 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 a faith is not just a set of ideas. It is a confidence in Jesus. It's a confidence in a God who is real. And my confidence is growing in His character, in His presence, in His ability. Listen, one of the things that we must settle as followers of Jesus is whether God is good or not. If we're not sure whether He's good, when life gets hard, man, we're just going to have this cloud over us. We have to settle that. And, and I'll tell you, there's one way we can settle it. We cannot settle the goodness of God based on our current circumstances because too many of our circumstances are not good. So how do we know that God is good? Well, we need something in the past that can settle that for us. And I, I want to you, you know what that is. It is the cross. When Jesus died for us, that's the kind of thing a good God would do for us because we didn't deserve it. He sends His own Son to pay the price that we deserved. And when we question whether God is good, we must look back to the cross. Let that remind us, no, no, wait a minute. God is good. This might be bad, but God is good. We have a growing confidence in His goodness, a growing confidence in His presence that when we come to know Him, there's not a place we go that He is not. And a growing confidence in His ability. You know, after, when He died, he, <laughs> three days later, they put Him in a, in a tomb and He rose again. That means there's nothing that He cannot overcome. And, he, and they, by the way, they left the stone rolled away when he, when he rose again. And that was not so He could get out. That's so the world could see in. And to see that He was not there, that He is alive, He is able. And so faith is our growing confidence in Him. Our growing trust that He's good and that He's here and that He's able. So I just want to kind of give, give that definition. But, but here's the thing. We would rather not. We would rather not live by faith. Most of us, if we were just left to ourselves, we'd rather not do that. We, we would rather just stay comfortable. We'd rather just do what we know. We'd rather stay what, with what is familiar. And listen, the Lord will let us. The Lord does not force us to trust Him. But oh, what we miss when we do. Oh, what we miss when we choose to, no, I'd rather just stay back and stay with what I've known rather than take this next step that He's leading me toward. We miss out just knowing Him better. We miss out seeing on what He can do that maybe we've never seen before. So there's this part of our own human nature that says, no, I don't really want to do that. We have a choice to make over and over and over when we choose to live by faith, when we choose to have this growing confidence in Him. And that's what leads us to, that leads us to our passage today. You see, in, in Joshua chapter 3, uh, we are at the end of a 40-year period where the, you might have heard of the, the children of Israel, where God delivers them from Egypt and, and He leads them through the, the takes them through the, the crossing of the Red Sea and He parts the Red Sea and, he, and he, he leads them through that and He wants to lead them into the Promised Land. They come to a place called Kadesh Barnea and the Lord says, I want you to go into there, but they send some spies in and they go, no, no, there's giants over there and I don't think we want to do that. And they say no to God. They, just, they choose not to trust Him. And so the Lord says, okay, you don't have to. But for the next 40 years, you, you, this generation, you're just going to kind of go in circles until your children, until you die off and your children grow up. And that's where we are now. About 40 years later, 
It's the next generation. It's probably about a million people. They've been wandering in the desert, and now, once again, they've come to the edge of the Jordan River, and the Promised Land is on the other side of this river. But there's a problem. There's something, there's a barrier, there's something in between where they are and where they know God wants them to be, and it is the Jordan River. And at this time of year, the Jordan River is at flood stage. Some estimate that at that time, it would have been about a mile across. And it was, it was at flood stage. It was a rushing river. And so, they, they are in a predicament. And so as we look at their situation and we walk through Joshua chapter 3, I want to, I want to give some suggestions about what we learn about God when we live by faith. And I just, if we can just walk through that together. And I, I want to I go ahead and give you just kind of the, the first truth about God when it comes to living by faith. And then we'll, we'll read in just a moment. And that is this, is that, that God often brings us to crossroads. God often brings us to opportunities to trust Him. Now, we don't like those. We don't like those times because there are times when we don't know the answer. It, it might be a trial we're going through and, and, and a problem we're facing. We don't know how it's going to work out. I'm not saying God brings every bad thing in our life. I'm not saying that. But still, we, we're trying to figure out what does it mean to trust you in the midst of this. Sometimes it's a new opportunity. We don't know what... What does God want me to do? God is faithful to bring opportunities where we have to choose to trust Him. He's faithful to do that. Sometimes when we find ourselves in these kind of stressful situations, we think, well, maybe God's not working. Well, sometimes it's actually evidence He is working. He's just bringing you to a place maybe where you trust Him in ways you haven't had the opportunity to before. He's faithful to do that. But still, how do you follow God forward when you can't see the way through. When the barrier is too big, when the challenge is too great, how do you follow Him? Well, let's start. Let's pick up in in verse 2 of Joshua chapter 3, if you want to read with me. It says, after three days, the officers went throughout the camp. I don't know if I said to you, there's like maybe a million people. There's a lot of people. They're giving orders to the people. When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the Levitical priest carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. I love that part right there. Then you'll know which way to go, since you've never been this way before. We often find ourselves in those places, right? Haven't been here before. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the ark. Do not go near it. So here's something we learn about living by faith. Living by faith means watch where God is moving. Watch where God is moving. He told them, if you want to know which way to go, watch where the Ark of the Covenant goes. Now, let me tell you what that was. The Ark of the Covenant was actually a box. It was, it was a box that was four feet long, two feet tall, two feet wide. Inside of the box was like the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments and a number of other things. But most importantly... That box represented, at that time in history, that box represented the presence of God. So what he's saying is, you pay attention to where God's moving, and that's how you know where to go next. That's how you know what to do. In other words, don't don't just run half-cocked into the river, and don't have a meeting trying to figure out how far you got to go around the river. The first thing you do is you watch where God is moving. Henry Blackaby is a man I have a lot of respect for. He said this, he said, discover where God is working and join him in his work. Look, we don't, we don't have to ask God to work. He's already working. We just have to learn to recognize what is he doing? Where is he working? What does it look like to join him? But how do we do that today? I mean, how do we watch for the moving of God? I mean, he's not a box that we watch, right? In fact, we don't see him with our eyes. But he is moving. So how do we learn to recognize what should we do? How do we, how do we know where he's moving? And I, I would give you, I would suggest there are three factors to, to pay attention to, especially when you're making major decisions. Three factors that God tends to use and kind of lines them up. One is, I would just call the leading of the Holy Spirit. And, and there I'm talking about paying attention to the circumstances you're in, paying attention to 
a burden that you have that you just can't shake? The leading of the Holy Spirit, God's Word, and wise counsel. That's how you determine where God is moving. You, you pay attention to what, what's going on around me, and then what does God's Word say about that? And, and I am saying you can look up what does the Bible say about certain topics, but I'm really talking about just in your regular, daily reading of the Bible, what does God bring out that maybe I didn't expect? Now, we've got to be careful. We can, we can kind of make the Bible say what we want it to. I'm not suggesting that at all. But I'm saying in our regular, daily time with God and in where we're taking in His Word, what is He saying to us? We pay attention to that. And then in the midst of, of all that, we, we, want, we seek wise counsel. Uh, a few years ago, my wife and I, we had been pastoring in, in the Portland area for 23 years, and God had began to, I began to really wrestle, not with God, but that maybe God was leading us to a new ministry. And uh, I, I didn't say to you earlier specifically, I, 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 we work with pastors and we do it in two ways. One is I work with the North American Mission Board, which is, uh, works with pastors, I work with pastors in several states in the West. But I'm also a part of a church called Resonate Church. We're a collegiate church planting church and we're on 16 universities and I get to mentor all of our pastors. So I serve as pastor to the pastor there. And the guy who started the church I mentored him when he was in seminary, so we've had this long relationship. And we felt like the Lord might be leading us to move from being the the lead pastor where I was to move to resonate and start working with other pastors, but I wasn't sure about that. I wrestled with it for about three years, and when I talk about a burden, it just wouldn't go away. I'd begin to wonder, you know, if it was the Lord's timing to move us and One of the things about serving with Resonate is that every pastor has to raise their own financial support. The the church doesn't pay them. So so that meant at my age, after being at a church that loved us and that we loved them, we had, you know, we'd seen the Lord do amazing things. I'm thinking about leaving this church where I had a paycheck to go raise my own financial support to be a part of this. So I sought out about six of my mentors the area of wise counsel here. I, I'd been praying about it, couldn't shake it. I was seeking God's Word in it. And I went to each of these men that had spoken into my life many times, and I, I shared with them, I'm wondering if the Lord le- wants us to leave, raise our own financial support, and go do this. I expected each one of them to say to me, have you lost your mind? What are you thinking? And some of them said, you know, I kind of hate to see you leave the church, but I got to tell you, I could see this would be a good fit. It seems like the Lord's at work here. Not a single one of them said, I think you're losing your mind. And I had to pay attention to that. That was quite the affirmation. And the Lord lined up those things. His Word, the leading of the Spirit, wise counsel, and that helped us to to know where He's leading. And And I would say that to you, especially when it comes to making major decisions to to look for all three, not just two out of the three, but all three, and let God line them up. We watch for where God is moving. That's one aspect, and that's what they were doing. Well, we're supposed to get to the other side. How do we do it? Well, watch where God is moving. And then that leads to the second truth about living by faith, and that is, I'll just say it this way at first here, faith and obedience go together. Faith and obedience go together. Faith is not just a feeling. Faith is not just an understanding. Faith always leads to action of some kind, of obedience of some kind. So let's pick up in verse 6. So Joshua said to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I'll begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel so that they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. There's a transition in leadership there. And then verse 8, Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Now remember, this is a rushing river that is at flood stage. Now, the Scripture doesn't tell us what the priests actually said after Joshua told them to do this. I can imagine what they're thinking. They're like, what did he say? (laughs) 
We're supposed to go take the heaviest thing we can find and go stand in this rushing river. Yep, that's what he said. And so that's exactly what they do. They step into that water. Faith always requires obedience. It requires often taking the step and we don't know what's going to happen next. In fact, let me, say, let me say it to you this way. That living by faith means ob- obeying God at step one, even if he hasn't shown you step two. Following God by faith means obeying God at step one, even if he hasn't shown you step two. He just told them, go stand in the water. He didn't say then. He didn't say what was coming next. He just said, that's as much as he told them, go stand in the water. Now, what we would like for God to do is we would like to say, God, if you'll show me what to do next, and then after that, and show me how it's all going to work out, then I'd be happy to trust you. But that's not trusting. In in a sense, that's us trying to control. God often will show us one step at a time because he's just as interested in us learning to know him better and trust him more as he is in the end results. Always. And so, so he says, you need to obey me. Well, we've talked a little bit about when it comes to major decisions. What about just in everyday life? What, it, what does it mean to, for, to live out our faith in obedience in everyday life? Well, I'll say this, until he tells you something, what to do next, you do what you already know to do until he tells you what to do next. And, and that means we already know he tells us to pray. One thing you can do is you keep praying. Listen, prayer is a step of faith. We're talking to the God that we cannot see, trusting him to do what we cannot do. Sometimes we'll say this, prayer, uh, how how do we say it? We'll say, you know, prayer changes things. And that's true, but I would rather say it this way. God changes things when we pray. The power is God, not our words. But he says pray. He tells us to pray. He tells us to trust him. We keep praying. You want to be a church of prayer. We want to be a people of prayer. It means we're trusting him day after day. We pray. The Bible talks about tithing, about giving the first fruits of our income to him. Boy, that's a step of faith every time. I mean, Beverly and I committed when we got married that that the first fruits of our income would always go to the Lord through his church. And I... I don't know that there's ever a time you, you, when we used to write checks. You remember those things? Those checks are pieces of paper. And you, there was every month, there would always be, you know, I could use this for something else. No, we're giving it to the Lord first because He's our provider. So it's a, that's, that's obedience and, and it's faith. It's trusting Him. It's also true about when we share our faith with others, right? Often fear keeps us from doing that. The fear of rejection or, or fear of lots of things. But we care. We, we believe in what God says to do. And we, and we care more about the other person's eternal destiny than our own fear. So we keep trusting and we keep acting. Faith is always connected to obedience. Our faith is not just found in how we feel, but in what we do. So, walking by faith means we We look for where God's moving. It means we obey. But then it it means a third thing that we find in this passage. And this is my favorite part of the passage. And this, this I shared this little part, part of this anyway, I shared at the retreat that Tyler was alluding to. But here's my favorite part of this passage and of walking by faith. And that is, we learn that God works upstream. I want you to know God works upstream. Here's what I mean by that. We'll start in verse 15. It said, As soon as the priests who carried the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. You go on to verse 15. Now the Jordan is at flood stage, as we said, all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam or Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan. While the water flowing down to the Sea of Arabah, that is the the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan 
and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation and completed crossing on dry ground. Now, did you notice what it said there back in, in verse 13 and 15? What it said is that the moment that the priest's feet touched the water, something happened. It says that the water was cut off up near the, near the town of Adam, or Adam, Zarethan. That's about 19 miles upstream. So that means the moment they obeyed the Lord and stepped into the river, what did they see happen? Nothing. <laughs> Not a thing. Have you ever done that? Have you ever obeyed the Lord? Okay, Lord, I'm going to do it. And I'm doing what you tell me to do. And like, nothing seems to be changing. Well, our tendency is to think, well, if I don't see it changing, then it must not be changing. If I don't see God working, then he must not be working. But that's never true. God's always doing more than we can see. He's always doing more than we know. So it says that the moment they stepped in, God was at work. It's just it was upstream. 19 miles upstream. That means, I don't know how it was cut off. I don't know if there was a landslide. A landslide. The Lord can work with however he wants to. But he cut it off, and the river stopped. So it took a while for 19 miles. So what did they do? They just kept standing in that water. And eventually, I just wondered, little by little, I'm like, hey, so water seems like it's gone down to you? Huh? Yeah, it's kind of getting down to my, my waist here. Hey, hey, keep standing, you know. And they just kept standing, and they kept standing. And it says, until everybody walked by on dry ground. It probably didn't take long in that hot Middle Eastern sun for that ground to turn dry. And what they learned right there is what I want us to learn. I want us to never forget. God works upstream when we obey Him. When we do what He says, He works upstream. That's who He is still today. That's, that's what He does. I told, uh, I told the folks at, at our retreat, I picture while they're still just standing there, see a million people watching them. Don't you love it when people watch you obey the Lord? I hate it. <laughs> what they've heard their whole life is the story of God parting the, the, the waters. I wonder if a bunch of them thought, okay, here it goes. We're going we're gonna to see our parting of the Red Sea uh, on the, here in the Jordan River. They step into the water and nothing happens. And I just, I think somebody probably yelled, you must be doing it wrong. Listen, when you obey the Lord, there may likely always be somebody to tell you you're doing it wrong. But they weren't. They were living, they were standing by faith. Listen, living by faith means obeying God even when I don't see anything happening. I keep obeying. I keep trusting. Trust that He's working upstream in His way and in His timing. Not in our way, not always what we want, certainly almost always not in our timing. But He's working. That's what He does. And listen, in the situations in your personal life, maybe even right now where it doesn't make sense, where it's so hard, where you can't see the next step of obedience, God is working upstream to bring about His plans and His work in your life. You keep standing in the water even if you don't see it going down yet. Because God works upstream. You know, I mentioned the first church that I pastored was in Monmouth, Oregon. It's a little college town, Central Oregon. Or Western Oregon, it's not Central. And uh, when I first came to the church, I didn't come as pastor. I came as a campus minister and I led worship. And it was a church plant. There were 15 people there the first day I arrived, and the, the nursery for the children was in the women's restroom. I'm like, I don't know why anybody would come to this church, but they did. And we began to grow, and the Lord had led us to be able to purchase a piece of property. I heard you guys recently did that. 
It was, it was on a highway, just on the south part of our town. And we, we had a mission team coming, and we, were, we had done the excavating. We were getting ready to pour. We had the forms up. We were getting ready to pour the foundation. And a man from the Oregon Department of Transportation drove in. And he said, hey, uh, I wanted to see if you could show me your access right to use our highway, to drive off and on our highway to your property. He said about 30 years ago, the state of Oregon went up and down Highway 99 here and, and we bought all the access rights. Maybe they use it to pay to care for the highway, I don't know. But said, we, would you show us your access right? And we, we say, access what? <laughs> Well, we never heard of an access right. What, what are you talking about? They said, well, you know, the Nazarene church, they're building down by Corvallis, and it cost them about $40,000 for their access rights. So we were, our situation was at that time, we had a, a $100,000 interest-free loan. This was 1988. That still was not a lot for a building. So if we were going to have to pay $40,000... Well, that would just stop everything. We're like, well, well, sir, we don't have one and we don't know what to, we don't even know what to say. We've never heard of it. And uh, so he went away and he said, well, we'll meet again in a week. And so as a church, all we needed to do was pray. Lord, what are you, we thought we were following your will. Are you, are you trying to stop us? Are, are you trying to stop this? You have something else in mind? What in the world's an access right? Lord, we need you to show us what you want. So, all, I mean, that's all we need, could do. And so the week goes by. Our pastor, who, by the way, is still my best friend, he, he met with the guy, and they met together, and he said, listen, uh, I checked the records again. In fact, I have checked them three times to make sure that this is right. But he said, it seems that 30 years ago when we bought up all the access rights, we bought up every access right except one. Guess which one it was. He said, if you'll give me a dollar, we'll be, we'll be even. I don't know why a dollar. But it was ours. And I began to think about that. And you know what? 30 years before we even knew to pray about it, God was working upstream to preserve a place for His church. Because that's who He is. That's still who He is. That's what He does. And as a church, you must trust Him. That's what you're doing today. Don't ever stop. Everything He's leading you to next is to lead you to continue to learn to trust Him. He never moves us out of that. <laughs> One time in this church, once we had built this church and I had become the pastor, finances were really, really tight. And so one, one Sunday after church, we just said, hey, we're just going to ask the Lord's provision if you'd just stay. And so we just formed a big circle in our worship area. And we're just praying. And my wife, if she was here, she would tell you, she was praying, Lord, would you, pre would you please provide? We you know we have the need. Would you please provide so we don't have to trust you so much? Oh, maybe that wasn't the right thing to pray. But isn't that how we feel? God, get me through this so I don't have to keep trusting you so much. And the Lord's like, no, no, that's exactly what I want you to do. I want you to keep trusting me. I want you to keep trusting me. So listen, if you don't know what to do next, you keep doing what you know to do until God shows you what to do next. You keep trusting Him. If you've come to a crossroads where, uh, a place where you have to trust Him, that's like, likely evidence of God at work, you step into that water and you keep standing. You keep trusting Him. And if it feels like you've been standing in the water and it hasn't gone down, you keep standing anyway, and you keep trusting. Why? Because He is worthy. Now, one final thought here. Uh, a few years ago, Beverly and I had the opportunity to go to Israel. And one of the places we stopped was the place the archaeologists believe this took place. 
where they crossed the Jordan, just outside of Jericho. And, and this is, had already been a very special story to me. So as soon as we get there, Beverly and I take our shoes off and we go put our foot in that water, step in that water. But what our guide was telling us that we didn't know is that archaeologists believe that that same place where uh, Joshua led the Israelites to cross the Jordan is very likely the same place in the Jordan River where Jesus was baptized. And I begin to think of the symbolism of this. You think about, here's, here's Joshua leading the Israelites from bondage to life, from wandering purposelessness to purpose. The Hebrew word for Joshua is Yeshua. That's the word for Jesus. Same word for Jesus. And I began to think about how Jesus has delivered us. You see, we all have our own river that we cannot cross. It's the river of our sin that keeps us from knowing God. But God in His great love for us, while we were still sinners, sent His Son to cross that river for us, didn't He? That river of sin and death. There was only one way, only one way, and that was for Jesus to take on the sin and death that we deserved, and that's exactly what He did on the cross. He, he took the death that we deserved that we might receive the life that He deserved. For Joshua's people, assurance and confidence came as they stood on the dry land and looked back at that river. For us, it's not the river. For us, assurance and confidence comes as we stand on the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, where He died for us, on that empty tomb where He rose again and is alive today. That Jordan River crossing convinced the Israelites that God was with them. Let the cross convince you that when you come to know Him, He is with you. He is with you every day, in every battle you face, in every river you cross. So what is that barrier for you? What is it that stands between you and where the Lord wants you to go? Will you trust Him? Will you take the step? Will you stand there until He makes the way? And listen, if you're here today and you've never yet given your life to Jesus, man, I encourage you to take that step into the water. You will never be the same again. Let's bow together. Our musicians come and I want to just ask you as a, as a follower of Jesus, what is He saying to you today? Maybe there's a place where He's nudging you to say, I want you to trust me here. Would you do that? Would you just say, Lord, I'm going to, best I know how, I'm going to step in the water and trust you. I'm not just going to try to do this myself. I, I want to walk with you. I want to lean on you. I want to trust you. And if you're here today and you've, you've never yet taken that step to place your trust in Christ, I want to, I want to give you that opportunity. I, I'm going to I'm going to voice a prayer that if you would like, you could kind of repeat after me. And it's not magic words or anything like that. You say this from the honest intent of your heart. But maybe just say something like this to the Lord. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you are good. I thank you that you died on the cross for my sin. I admit to you that I'm a sinner. I thank you that you have paid for my sin. I receive your gift, your payment for my sin. Thank you. And I submit my life to you. I surrender everything I know and everything I have to following you. I thank you that you've risen from the dead and that you are here. And I submit my life to you. Lord Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that you are real. I thank you that you 
lead us way beyond just following a set of teachings to following a person, to following you. Lord, I pray for each person in this room that you would speak and that they would hear and that they would trust and that they would stand trusting you. And I pray for any person who may have, for the first time, surrendered to you that, uh, Lord, I pray that the rest of their life would be so dramatically different as they learn to follow you. Lord, let us be people who live by faith, who trust you, who learn to watch and discover how you're working upstream. Thank you that that's who you are. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.